I'm Bobby Sutherland, um, assistant professor in the Department of History. So I first encountered the piece in high school, um, and I was intrigued by it. But my first, the, the, my, what I would consider my real first encounter was in college, I decided on my own to read it in Middle English. And, of course, this was somewhat tricky, but I was surprised by how quickly I was able to figure it out once you read it out loud. And I say that that's the moment that I became a medievalist because I started reading it and I thought, this, this is fantastic. I was shocked by all the body humor. I didn't, you know, we have this idea that back in the olden days, they didn't do those sorts of things. And I was so taken with it. And I realized that this was what I really loved was this history and literature together. It was, you know, when I was studying these older texts, I was doing both at the same time. And so, yeah, I really do think that reading the Canterbury Tales for the first time is what made me a medievalist. So I study um, social history, um, late medieval social history, and actually the text I work on is French, but it's from around the same time as the Canterbury Tales. And so when I look at the Canterbury, Stale, Canterbury Tales more as a historian than as a literary scholar, what intrigues me is um, the tales as a state satire. So there's this idea in the Middle Ages that people belonged to three different categories, and they never really did, but there was this idea perpetuated that you are part of the church, part of the state, uh, sorry, part of the church, part of uh, the nobility, or part of the peasantry. And Chaucer, of course, is pointing out that there's a much bigger category, or far more categories than that. You have, you know, the miller, and you have the reeve, and the franklin, and the sailor, and the clerk. And so this idea of a state satire is, you know, sort of, these people are from all these different levels of, of society, interacting with one another, how do they see themselves? How do they see each other? And so as a social historian, especially someone who looks at the bourgeoisie, which is developing at this time, I love looking at characters like the Franklin, who are sort of in the middle class. If, well, they didn't have a middle class, but in this sort of intermediate position and trying so hard to get to this higher position, um, those characters are really fascinating to me. And yeah, they're fictional, but they're still portraying the attitudes and ideas of the time. But, so the Black Death has happened 50 years before at this point, so the population has declined considerably, which means that the people in the lower classes have begun to gain more wealth, um, and, or more power as well. Um, so in England, for example, the age of marriage has dropped, contrary to what we think. People in England um, did not get married at 16 in the Middle Ages, or 12. They were getting married in their early to mid-20s. After the Black Death, they're getting married at 18, 19, 20 because you can't. Um, and so there's greater um, opportunities, greater wealth. After the Peasants' Revolt in 1385, so right when Chaucer is writing, um, and people like Langland are writing right before that, um, the peasants have been told that, guess what, your wages are going to go back to what they used to be, you're going to go, you know, lose your privileges, and they revolt, and they fail, but in a sense, they ultimately do succeed, because things can't go back ever to what they had been before. So I'm looking at these people's attitudes about their social class. Chaucer gives us a fictitious character, true, but an opportunity to see what they were thinking and how they would represent themselves in, in these blunt terms. So yes, it's a fictitious character, but Chaucer isn't going to make this up out of whole cloth. So it gives an insight that I can't get from other texts necessarily where the person isn't as self-consciously relating this is who I am, and this is how I see my social position. Chaucer is considered the father of the modern English language by some people, so um, he is one of the first people to sort of really effectively blend the new, well, not that new by that point, but the French, the Norman French vocabulary into what had been the Germanic Anglo-Saxon language, Old English, to create something like modern English. This is one of the great works of the English language. Most people are familiar with Shakespeare, Enough people have read some Chaucer, but not everyone, and they tend to think, ugh, Chaucer. But this is where a lot of the stories that Shakespeare used came from. This is where the English language came from. And I think the fact that we have such early you know, printed copies of these te this text and have for so long is an indication of how important people have always seen this text to be.